So, ladies and gentlemen, great honor for me to be here. Welcome to Berlin. It's a cool city. It's a vibrant, dynamic city. It's a city for young people, and so you will have come to the right place. So the biggest, <laughs> the biggest compliment I've ever got thus far in my life has been somebody saying to me, you are mad. And um, we are going to put this to the test now. So, here you see two things. One is a probably quite well-known young man, and there are my, is my cuckoo's nest. So, in the end, I'm going to ask you, whom are you going to award $135 billion? This guy, or me and my cuckoo's nest? Because the question is, what is actually really going to make a difference to your life? And I think there are some people who have already a pre-cut sort of idea. Well done. I'm going to disappoint you. <laughs> this is what keeps the world together. This is what you are all part of, an absolutely intricate fantastic web of life. As far as we know, only present on this one planet, which we share with all of this diversity. Go and have a look at it at the museum just up the road. <laughs> what are we doing with it? So you know, in Germany, about 500 years, somebody nailed a few CCs on the wall. I'm a good Protestant, so I have to know these dates. That is when the world had 95% of its entire globe covered in relatively intact ecosystems. There you see a very important date, 1809. Anybody why that is the most important date in the world? Birth year of Charles Darwin, remember. Also the onset of the Industrial Revolution. And look what we've done. That we've driven up agri agriculture is all right. That we are creating secondary vegetation, destroyed landscapes, that is the worrying thing. This is what we do to ourselves, not necessarily represented in this audience, but we are becoming, we are an urban society, we are becoming an old society. We are changing the setup of us as a species, not just of the world we are part of as well. However, there is innovation, isn't there? We can technologically or however get out of this mess. So this is a very interesting hypothesis here, which I fully subscribe to. It says all the important innovations that make our life comfortable have already been had. And you, please, ask yourself in the morning, when you get up, what is more important to you? Looking at this thing or having a glass of clean drinking water? And the clean drinking water is late 19th century. So think about it. We are, as far as technology is concerned, you probably will have heard a lot about technology here and you will hear more about technology here. It's fiddling on the edges. Listen. Our species is 70,000 years old, and all we can do at the moment is boil water. What progress is that? That's what our ancestors could do two million years ago. So, we are standing off a tip of a fern. I'm a fern expert by trade, um, one of few, but nevertheless, you can see how important we are, and we are looking into nowhere. Now, is that true? Let's have a look at this. We are going back to the past full steam ahead. The growth that we produced through innovation and hard labor in the Middle Ages was 2.5% per year. Enlightenment, industrial revolution, military industrial complex, after the Second World War, pushed up tenfold to 2.5%. Today, we are already halfway down, and by 2100, when you all will be happy living, we are back at the Middle Ages. I think this is one of the things that people, in a way, sense 
and might get nervous about, and they are seeking simple solutions. There are no simple solutions in life, they've never been. Anyway, it's not as hopeless as it seems. But remember, we are taking nature for granted and squandering it, we are changing ourselves, and we are living in the illusion that we can thrive on innovation and get ourselves out of the mess we've put ourselves into. If you look at the history of innovation, you can see that when you take a synoptic view, as this guy does, there is very little one can suggest how the modern stagnation in innovation and growth can be cured. Even more important, where are actually the institutions that have created innovation? Does anybody know this man there? He created, with a cohort of a few others, the Industrial Revolution, Josiah Wedgwood. He was a homemade uh, potter who thought about how to use scientific innovation. He was self-taught and so on and so forth. He didn't go to a university, he didn't go to college, he just used his brains, his ingenuity in a craft setting to build the modern transport system. The mother of all innovations, of which we are part as humans, is nature. And now comes the funny thing. 99.9% of life on Earth that we share this one planet with, we have no bloody clue about. Imagine that. There is something that is functioning for 3.8 billion years, and you are all part of this unbroken record of innovation for 3.8 billion years. That's how long your ancestry goes back, each and every one of you. We have no idea what we share this planet with, nor how it has come about. It's a completely untapped resource, and we are just squandering it. Any idea? how many species you eat, your calories on how many species they depend. 60% on four, they're grasses, 90% on 16 species of probably 10, 20, 100 million species. We have a very, very narrow view of life and diversity. But now we have the technology and I think the societal innovations that we need to change this and be smart about this planet. Not try to escape it, go to Mars or whatever, but stay here and make it livable for all of us. And funnily enough, you will say, I would argue natural history museums are probably the key. So, <laughs> this is not a map, or it is a map, of where humans live. It's also a map of where natural history collections are. Because what we hold in our collections, like the cuckoo's nest, um, needs to be cared for, curated. And there are millions and billions of objects that we look after in these um, seven or 8,000 collections. And they are where humans are. So humans and collections are very closely associated. And here, another three geezers. Sorry, it's all men. Um, but does anybody know what they've done for you? So the top one there is the one who um, enabled globalization through um, looking at quinoa and anti as an anti-malaria drug, enabling global trade for the first time. He also did a few other things. The second one is responsible that we can wear woolen suits. He went to Spain, nick a few sheep, breed it with others in the UK. And Alexander von Humboldt actually, in a way, freed up South America because he taught them that their natural resources and their strengths as a population would eventually set them free from the yoke of the Spanish. All of them are intricately linked to natural history museums and collections. Alexander von Humboldt's collections are in my museum, as you might imagine. So, what does this stuffy stuff we have actually do for you? What has this shark ever done for you, other than probably 
making you giggle because it's so ugly. <laughs> Just a few things. Damien Hirst learned his trade, how to pickle sharks in the Natural History Museum, made a few bugs on the way. Unfortunately, you can't wear this beautiful outfit any longer at the Olympic Games because the shark skin is used um, to model its exterior. It breaks the water resistance and it makes you win competitions. Um, it's now used in aeroplanes as well. But look at the bottom. So as we are all growing older, the battle we all face with Alzheimer's might actually be decided by shark antibodies. We have no clue, first of all, what life on Earth is, second, what potential it holds. And all we are focusing on is wanting to go to Mars. It just makes me angry. Thank you. I think I know now who's going to win. Um, <laughs> so, we can now actually do it. We have the digital revolution. We can connect people. We can jointly explore nature. We also have the big advantage that we have an emotional relationship with nature. I don't have an emotional relationship with Mars. Probably a Mars bar, but that's a different story. <laughs> I'm a geneticist, so I do love um, playing around in a laboratory. So people and nature can form a new contract. And that's where we all need to thrive for. We need societal and scientific innovation. Scientific innovation alone, it's a pipe dream. It does not deliver in the absence of society. Whatever the scientists say, and I'm one of them, we need a model of this world in order to manage it sustainably for the planetary and for our own health and mind. And we can now all join in to draft this. How? We are going to explore here in Berlin and in various other places, but I think museums are probably not a bad place to start to bring society, especially in this age, together again. So, in economy, in a capitalist economy, apparently there is one dictum deep change or slow death. That goes for a lot of industries. And I would argue that is the challenge we now face. I want to live well on this planet. I want to share it with a lot of other people and these critters. And therefore, we need to think about how we are going to do it. And it cannot be the same. It cannot be spending 135 billion dollars on putting a German astronaut into space. This ISI station has cost all of you $135 billion. And what has it done for you? Now then the answer comes, space travel has given us the Teflon pan. Think what you would do with a Teflon pan without an egg. <laughs> Nothing. So, with that very deep thought, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very much. <laughs>